Hi, everyone. Welcome. And we are going to talk about female health concerns. So we have, um, it's based on an article by the Women's Health Guide, and it's by Dr. Jockers about overcoming the seven common female health concerns. We realize you could have lots of questions um, after you leave the presentation that might not have been answered. So Dr. Udani here has made herself available. Feel free to give her a text with all of your questions. So I wanted to welcome Dr. Udani with us here. She is our naturopathic doctor here at Justine Blaney Wellness Center. And she has is really, really passionate about women's health, but also digestion issues, chronic pain, stress, you know, um, skin conditions. And she truly believes that everyone has the ability to make healthy and long lasting changes. Please help me welcome Dr. Udani. Thank you so much, Angela. Good evening, everybody. It's um, it's a wonderful day today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our upcoming webinars, and then we're going to jump right into our exciting talk. So upcoming, we have um, Elimination Diet, what is it about, and how does it help us? And this is going to be talk done by Dr. Justine. And then we're also going to have a talk on five ways to manage holiday stress, because the holidays are coming. Can you believe that so fast? And we are also going to have a Christmas sit and fit, a, a sit and fit uh, webinar for you, and also a natural relief for joint pain that is also coming up. And these are all free, and we highly recommend that you tune in and check these out. So today's talk is about women's and women's concerns and our health guide for that, overcoming seven common female health concerns that we as ladies might experience um, throughout our lives. So let's jump right into it. So what are these, uh, what are these common female health concerns, you might ask. So, um, you know, a lot of times we as women, we tend to have a little bit more hormonal shifts happening in our bodies uh, compared to men. And because of this, we tend to experience a whole range of uh, concerns from mood issues to weight gain, weight fluctuations, thyroid problems, low libido can be an issue as well, fatigue, feeling tired all the time, Osteoporosis, so brittle bones, um, easy to be experience fractures. That's another issue too. And of course, hair thinning can be another concern that we might experience. So today we're going to go into every single one of these and also think about how to um, help your body heal and also some of the factors that could be causing these concerns. So a lot of times um, we might experience these issues when we're going through something called menopause and perimenopause. So every woman goes through menopause and this can be, this can start as early as your mid thirties or as late as your fifties, for example. And this is really where our menstrual cycle just slows down and we start to um, really not get a period anymore. And, uh, you know, it might be my experience, a period once every three months, then it slows down and slows down more. And all of a sudden the period stops and we have entered menopause. So this usually occurs between 45 to 55 years of age. And this is uh, one of uh, one of the charts that can explain what kind of happens with our estrogen levels. Cause this is one of our, one of our amazing hormones that kind of keeps us, um, um, on top of things, let's just say that. Okay, so when it starts to go down, we start to get a lot of times we enter a stage called premenopause where we, we get irritability, mood swings, uh, we might experience cramps or sleep issues, and then we enter a stage called perimenopause. This is right before menopause happens. So then your period starts to get less and less, get lighter and lighter, uh, less frequent. You might experience weight gain, hot flashes, night sweats, um, more loss of libido, for example. And then you reach menopause, which is where the period completely stops. And you might experience, you know, mood changes because uh, mood changes, vaginal discomfort. You're at risk for osteoporosis because the, the hormone estrogen has steadily decreased. So does not sound fun. I know for sure. But what can we do? How can we lessen these effects? And we're going to talk a little bit about that, too. 
So here's one of the reasons for mood issues. So a lot of uh, a lot of times, you know, a major cause of depression can actually be inflammation. So I know you you've known a lot about inflammation. We talk about a lot about inflammation in our talks here, and you know, um, and you know, your brain is susceptible to inflammation as well. So the old theory was that you know depression happens because of uh, a, a low number of feel good neurotransmitters or feel good chemicals in your body. But the new theory is suggesting that it's actually inflammation that's causing these um, chemical feel good chemicals to be lower. So, um, and also your brain just isn't as sensitive to, to what is produced. So this can cause a lot of depression and anxiety uh, can happen because, uh, because of this inflammation in the brain as well. Number two is we're talking talk about weight gain. So how do we know what's a healthy weight? So instead of really looking at the BMI, which can sometimes be a little bit um, not accurate, you know, uh, we can look at your waist to hip ratio. So what does that mean is you want to uh, you want to be standing up and you know no slouching, and you want to find the smallest part of your um, your waist, which is kind of right above your belly button. And then you also want to find the widest part uh, of your hip. So you want to cover the um, hips or buttocks, like butts. And then you want to check the ratio there. So waist to hip ratio, if it's if it's anywhere below 0.8, then you tend to have a lower health um, health risk of uh, of um, you know obesity and all the other kind of issues that comes with that. And um, so this is this is a more accurate way to determine how are you doing. So just take a look at anything below 0.8 is considered healthier, and anything above 0.85 is you're at more risk for you know other complications associated with weight gain. Number three is thyroid problems. So you know I see a lot of patients that have, are like that tell me you know I've for some reason, I'm working out the same way. I'm doing everything the same, uh, but for some reason, I can't lose a pound. Or I look at bread and I gain three pounds. You know, or throughout my 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 day, I am gaining anywhere between one to two pounds. Like I don't know what's going on. I'm trying so hard to lose it, but nothing's happening. So when when this is a concern like this, and especially if you are breaching that point in in your age where you're experiencing menopause or perimenopause. We should look at your thyroid because your thyroid can be under functioning and it is a butterfly shaped gland right at the base of your neck and this makes something called thyroid hormone and this is very important for your metabolism your digestion your muscle bone and brain health and this is these problems are actually very common in women so you don't even have to be in your 40s or 50s you can be in your 20s and 30s and still experience thyroid issues and it's important to do some a, a, a comprehensive blood work panel if you're suspecting that something could be wrong with your thyroid and this is something that i do regularly uh, or i promote my patients to do so that way we can see exactly what's going on so something else that can happen with thyroid problems is that it affects your hormones so other hormones so um, an estrogen can affect the thyroid as well. So if you have too high, as too much estrogen floating around in the body, um, this can actually shut down the thyroid from being active. But if you have too low, it can also cause your uh, issues with the thyroid where it's not as active as you know um, it can be. So too high or too low of estrogen can negatively affect the thyroid. So. What can what are some symptoms about the about how, that you can know that something's going on with your thyroid? So these are some of the most common symptoms of underactive thyroid glands. So hypo means under, right? And thyroidism. So underactive thyroid, and this is for for most women. Um, the symptoms are really a lot of fatigue. So they're tired all the time. They might have dry skin, dry hair. Uh, brittle hair, for example, you can even feel like weight gain is one of the big symptoms too. Depression can be one of them, hair loss, hair thinning. Uh, some people also get like enlargement of their neck. So that's also called the goiter. That's another sign as well of underactive thyroid. Slow heart rate, constipation is one of them. 
cold hands and feet. So let's say everybody in the room is wearing t-shirts, but you feel like you're, you need to wear a sweater. Then that's, that's, uh, that means you can't really handle the, the heat or, or the cold. So that's another sign of an underactive thyroid as well. And fluid retention. So you might notice that you're, you, you just look bigger at the end of the day because there's a lot of water weight as well. So these are all some of the common, and of course, decreased libido can be a sign of it as well. So these are signs to look out for um, because they can be really like a lot, like pretty, um, pretty vague, right? So when you get a thorough intake done, we, we kind of go through everything like here just to make sure that what's, whatever is going on, could it be a result of an underactive thyroid? So it's important to keep an eye out for these symptoms so that we can kind of support your thyroid. The second and next one is that's a common concern could be low libido. So this can happen for various reasons, right? It could be physical and also emotional factors. Uh, so it might not just be a physical um, issue. It might not just be low nutrients or low vitamins low, or low hormones, but there's a very strong emotional factor with uh, libido, and, uh, in, especially in women. So and this can tend to increase a lot more during perimenopause and menopause. So during that period where hormones are fluctuating, some of the hormones are getting less and less, we can have low libido. And sometimes, you know, even something like polycystic ovarian syndrome or endometriosis, which is like a very painful condition where when you get your period, it's super painful, that can lead to low libido too, you know, because that affects you, that affects your mental health. So these are some things to look out for as well to see what, what else could be causing your low libido. And guess what, right? They play, um, they, they can play into the low libido and low libido can play into um, these, these uh, conditions. So it's like a, like a negative cycle that can happen. Some of the other re the reasons for low libido could be uh, changes in your vagina during perimenopause because of hormonal, the decrease in estrogen. So estrogen really helps to um, keep the tissue in the, uh, in the vagina um, like smooth and nice and lots of um, just like full. Okay, so when those when those hormonal levels are going down, the tissue starts to shrink. So and the vaginal wall becomes thinner and also gets the, to be drier. So the um, the lubrication can also go down as well. So then it makes it more difficult for uh, when you are performing an intercourse and it becomes less pleasurable as well. So these are uh, this is because of a, because of hormonal changes that you can go through during menopause. Now let's talk about fatigue. So, you know, tiredness, I think a lot of us are experiencing it right now as well with what's going on in the world. And also, you know, we just came out of a pandemic, so that can really have a mental effect, a mental uh, effect on our energy levels and, you know, our fatigue uh, factors. So this can you know, be because of physical, emotional, environmental, and lifestyle factors. And, and it's part of my job is to help you figure out what can it be and how can we kind of tackle it? How can we put it into a, uh, into a box? And how can we, you know, maybe help you figure out what else could be going on? So usually when you're going through perimenopause or menopause, you can feel really tired because, you know, these hormones can are all like just a lot of shifts in hormones happening and um you know there's reduction of certain hormones so you can feel more tired just and you can lose muscle mass as well um, and that can cause even more tiredness especially if you're exercising things like that so a lot of fun quote unquote fun things can happen when you're going through menopause unfortunately so what can we do to overcome uh chronic fatigue so this is like that tiredness where you feel like you got just got hit by a bus, you know, like where you wake up, you maybe had a good eight hours of sleep, but you still feel so tired or you have afternoon crashes in, in your energy um, every day. You're wondering why and, or you're drinking like three cups of coffee just to get just to get going through the day. And so these so the fatigue factor, like I said, can be like a lot of things can be causing it including brain inflammation, um, dysfunction of sleep, like not being able to sleep, infections can be causing, uh, low-grade infections can cause fatigue, uh, issues with your gut, so just be checking your microbiome, environmental toxins, being exposed to that, 
hormonal fluctuations, like we said, nutrient deficiencies, food sensitivities, and unstable blood sugar. And these will actually play together too. So they won't just be uh, they won't just be by themselves. So they'll affect the all the other things. So all of these can be affecting you at the same time. And it's like, so it's uh, I would say it's like someone like me, like a naturopath or a holistic professional will be looking at all of these to make sure what's really going on for you and how can we really figure out the root cause of your fatigue and fix it right there. Now, the other concern is osteoporosis. So this is when your bones become more brittle and easier to break because when you go through menopause and perimenopause, your hormone estrogen goes down and estrogen is very <clears throat> protective for bones, bone growth. And uh, when that's down, you, we tend to lose our bone mass more. So it becomes weaker, fragile, and can really have um, uh, your increased risk of fracture, especially in the hip or the spine, wrist, ankles, neck as well, not neck as much, but um, the other ones for sure. Um, and also, also poor nutrition, smoking, um, having a high thyroid, a post and uh, low thyroid, medications, you know, eating disorders can also cause uh, you to have an increased risk of osteoporosis. And you know, what's, what's, so what, what's the difference between a normal bone and osteoporotic bone? So normal bone uh, tends to be you know, it's more potentially larger, like, you know, more compact. There is um, basically more bone mass, right? Whereas an osteoporotic bone, it tends to be more brittle and it has less mass. So it can really handle the, the weight as much. So some symptoms of this could be you can, you can get tenderness or bone pain, um, little fractures where you bump into something and you you or you fall a lot of people you know as we get older if we slip and fall we might have a fractured hip for example um you can lose your height over time because you know you're losing bone mass uh chronic neck back and joint pain can be one of them as well and then you might notice that as we get older we tend to be more hunched so that's also could be a sign of um reduced bone mass and you're you're a little bit more likely to be osteoporotic the last concern, and certainly not least, is hair thinning. So this is a very common concern a lot of uh, us as ladies have, and it can be caused by hormonal shifts for sure. So um, so what do I mean by hormonal shifts? So that could be, you know, especially let's say after giving birth, you know, there is a big hormonal, you know, shift that happened right there. So a lot of women can experience hair loss then. A lot of women can experience hair loss during a menopause as well. And um, there's different kinds of uh, hair loss. So we're going to talk a little bit about it right now. So there is the hormonal hair loss, right? It's called androgenic alopecia. So that is the most common and tends to happen like kind of like at the top of the head. You can notice it at the sides of your, your temples as well. And it's it's it kind of looks like male pattern baldness. So you might notice that that's more due to hormonal uh, fluctuations. Then you can have alopecia areata, which is random spots in the hair can be uh, patchy. So it's a patchy hair loss all over the scalp. And this happens when the immune system attacks the hair. So, um, so the hair tends to fall off. And vitamin D deficiency can be a big, big factor for uh, alopecia and also for um, uh, thyroid as well. When your thyroid is under functioning, you can also have some, um, some of this happening. Then you can have telogen effluvium, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is basically meaning a hair fall due to extreme stress or um, stress that your body goes through. So um, you might have heard that people that, some, some people that experience COVID end up having a lot of hair fall. So that was because they, they, their body got pushed into this telogen effluvium stage of their hair cycle. And it also can be caused by Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid condition, where the hair just is falling more than it is growing. So these are the three types of hair loss that we also want to think about. So let's talk a little bit about the eight root cause factors of all of these concerns, because, you know, there was, there was quite a few and we want to figure out what is really going on. And, you know, at our clinic, we want to go to the root cause because we want to figure out how can we 
stop this from nipping in the butt. So these include insulin resistance, so being resistant to our, our blood sugar hormone insulin, chronic stress and poor sleep, inflammation and autoimmunity, having an autoimmune condition, um, dysbiosis in the gut, so having gut issues, digestive issues, um, you know, low stomach acid, so you're not able to able to absorb nutrients, chronic infections that you might not even know you're experiencing, but it's there. High exposure to toxins could be environmental, could be from workplace, could be from makeup. So all of those things and sluggish liver function and nutrient deficiencies. So let's jump right into those. So what are some signs of insulin resistance? So these are, um, so insulin is a hormone that is acts as a, um, the key that unlocks the, let's say the door for all the cells and it helps reduce your blood sugar levels. So if you have insulin resistance, that key is having a hard time opening, uh, opening the lock and opening the door. So you, your body produces a lot of insulin, a lot of insulin trying to, trying to open that key. Okay. So this is what insulin resistance means. So now insulin is flowing all through your body, trying to figure this out, trying to open the key, but it's doing other things as well. And what are some signs of insulin resistance? You tend to be, have some weight issues. So you tend to be overweight or trouble losing weight. You have a large appetite, like you want to eat um, quite a few, and it could be quite a few meals, and it could be just, you know, lots of um, sweets, okay? Sweets and pastries and things like that. Craving sweets after meals or feeling just like really, um, like you feel very tired after a meal too. That could be a sign of insulin resistance too. Yeah, like it's like it's mentioned here. Lots of thirst and urge to urinate. So you're getting up in the middle of the night to urinate three to four times. Uh, drinking lots of water. Uh, hormonal problems like PCOS can be a reason. Um, um, you know, with females, we can have more estrogen, testosterone going on with insulin resistance. So there's all these hormones, they kind of uh, pile on top of each other to make things worse, you know? Uh, acne, skin changes, so you can have darker darker skin changes uh, happening on your neck uh, and your creases, like elbows and things like that. High blood pressure and high, high triglycerides, high fatty acids in the blood can be also a sign of insulin resistance. So when that happens, I would like you to really um, get some extra blood work done or reach out to uh, somebody like myself so that we can figure out the root cause of, uh, we can really manage insulin resistance before it becomes full-blown pre-diabetes or diabetes and really start to affect everything else that could be the, that we just mentioned. So the other factor is, of course, chronic stress and not sleeping well. You know, chronic stress is something that we are experiencing daily and sometimes stress, you know, it might not go away, but how can we find uh, find tools to uh, to deal with it better? Because when stress just goes unchecked, it can increase your inflammation, your um, gut issues, hormonal imbalances, pain as well. When you're stressed, you can feel the pain more. Chronic symptoms and health issues can get a lot worse when we have uh, stress. And of course, stress is going to make you sleep not that well. You know, it's going to affect your sleep. You might be staying up, uh, tossing and turning, thinking about all the things that you're stressed about. So you might have trouble falling asleep or you're waking up too early or you're waking up at 3 a.m. All of these are because and potentially because of chronic stress. And, you know, when you're going through menopause, that doesn't help either because, you know, you, you have the hot flashes. And that is already kind of help making you stay up a little bit more than before. So chronic stress and poor sleep. So these are some symptoms to recognize, are you going through stress? So one of the big ones is, you know, um, feeling uh, anger or anxiety, irritability. Uh, you might some, Then you might reach a stage where you just like, I just don't care. Like you just feel so burnt out. You're just like, I just don't care. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to do anything, you know, that stage too. So then you start to feel fatigued. Uh, you might have decreased libido. You can have stomach problems, headaches, teeth grinding, um, and muscle tension, lots of tight muscles. You're holding on to so many things. So trouble concentrating as well. So these are all signs of stress. So I want to emphasize the symptoms of stress because I want you to be able to notice them. And as soon as you notice them, you can be more proactive 
and figure out holistic preventative ways to deal with it before it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes bigger, right? Be before it snowballs into uh, something larger. Then we want to talk about inflammation and autoimmunity because like the insulin resistance, the chronic stress, that will increase inflammation too. And, you know, and then you can be more at risk for developing autoimmune conditions. And um, systemic inflammation is like a little fire that kind of happens all through your body. Think of it like that. And it, it just wears and tears uh, on, on your body. And it just is something that I, myself, and Dr. Justine, we really um, tell our patients to, you know, watch out for and to calm down that inflammation because when, go when it goes unchecked, that's when it can lead to certain uh, conditions like autoimmune conditions. So we have some, um, something, uh, some image here about how inflammation affects the body. So basically think of it, like I said, it's like a fire, a little fire that's going on in all parts of the body. It's, it's breaking it down, wear and tearing on your organs, your heart, your brain, your thyroid, your lungs, your gut, kidneys, liver, skin, bones, it can affect everything. So, um, and you know, so for example, conditions like uh, acid reflux, Crohn's, also celiac disease, that is chronic inflammation of the gut, right? Inflammation of the heart, arterial, um, so your arteries and your veins can be, uh, that can result in high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, you know, inflammation of the brain, like I mentioned, can result in uh, depression, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, poor memory, even multiple sclerosis. Inflammation of the thyroid can result in hypoactive uh, uh, thyroid, you know, hypothyroidism. Skin can be acne, eczema, psoriasis, wrinkles, fine lines, like increased aging can be there. Even your bones, you can have decreased bone mass, right? Risk of osteoporosis. So this inflammation, this fire, we want to find ways to really snuff it out from the from the beginning. That way, we become we stay we stay ahead of it, right? That's our goal in in, in preventative medicine is to stay ahead of this, uh, so that we we don't get to this level, right? And even if you're if you're experiencing some of these symptoms right now, it's okay. The body is so resilient that we can you know, um, we can improve these symptoms if we start with some basic steps. Now, another factor is low stomach acid and having a dysbiotic gut. So dysbiosis in the gut means that the, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria are not, you know, not, not doing well. So there's more of the bad bacteria and it's causing a lot of inflammation, a lot of gas and bloating and you know diarrhea or constipation so and what what it does is when your gut the lining of the gut is very very um very fragile let's say that so the lining of the gut is about one cell layer thick and your skin is uh, about seven cell layers thick so comparing that means you're comparing the skin is about the the texture of cardboard compared to the gut which is a texture of tissue paper so it's super easy to be damaged so when there's uh, gut dysbiosis, you're more likely to have gut inflammation and you can result in a lot of things like irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, all of these irritable bowel diseases and that inflammation can spread into the rest of the body. Fun things, right? So we're just talking about major root cause factors here because we just want you to be aware of what could be causing some of those uh, female concerns. And then we're of course gonna talk about how can we manage these. Another one is chronic infections. So these are some, these are like I mentioned, the, the bad bugs that can increase the inflammation in the body. So they can also contribute to other health issues, like lots of symptoms, like making the, making hormones, uh, hormonal issues worse, menopause transition harder, weight gain harder, fatigue worse, um, all of those things. And some of the examples of them, uh, the, these biotoxins are mold and yeast, Lyme disease, viral infections, bacterial endotoxins. So these are some things that we look at when we want to look at reducing inflammation. We look at things to help detox your body from these biotoxins as well. And another one is high toxin exposure. So this is a, this can be particularly harmful for women because, you know, we have a lot of hormonal uh, receptors in the body. And a lot of these toxins tend to uh, turn them on. 
So, for example, pesticides, uh, right? They can increase. They can act as uh, these the switch. They can turn on the switch for hormones and can cause a lot of different hormonal shifts in the body. Another one is a biotoxin like mold. So mold is a, fun a fungus unit you know, that can grow in your bathroom. It can grow in your basement or any like older, um, humid, dark, humid places. And it needs to be warm, moist, and damp. And these, these mold toxins can be so incredibly tricky and sneaky and stealthy because they will go into your body and they can increase uh, a lot of stress on the liver. And because our liver is our main detoxing organ, if that's not functioning well, we're going to have a lot of inflammation that's just going in the body. So, and they can also just spike up something, some uh, hormone called histamine, which can increase your risk of PMS, period issues, um, fatigue, weight gain, and digestive issues as well. So beware of these toxin uh, these toxins and finding ways to reduce your exposure. It can be amazingly beneficial for the female concerns because what we want to look at is, is we want to look at your health as a bucket, okay? Or your health or your state of your disease as a bucket. So a lot of times when you're healthy, the bucket of this toxin exposure is relatively low, but the disease can build up, you know, the toxins can be, uh, can increase, your stress can increase, your insulin resistance can increase, your um, inflammation can increase. So these keep adding on top and top of each other in the bucket. And then all of a sudden, you have, you know, you have processed foods in your diet, you're stressed, you're, um, you know, you're using a lot of different medications, and the bucket overflows. And that's when disease develops. So that's when the symptoms of, you know, for example, uh, Crohn's, Crohn's will appear, or um, hypothyroidism appears. So our goal is to make sure this bucket is never really full. We want to make sure it's as uh, as reduced as possible, you know, taking away that burden as much as possible is very, it's a, it's a big priority in what we do. And the other factor is sluggish liver function, right? Liver is, uh, it's wonderful. It's, it's such a big detoxifying organ in our body. It is so amazing that it actually repairs itself. So it's it's something that, you know, that just does so many different things in our body. It, it can detox your toxins. It can detox um, medications. It can um, transport your fats into the right places. It can help with glucose, um, you know, cutting down your blood sugar. So when the liver gets uh, gets sluggish, that can be because of these toxins. There's too many toxins affecting the liver. There's too many hormones affecting the liver. So it starts to slow down. And also another thing is constipation. But when you're constipated, you can uh, experience a sluggish liver because the liver is doing its, its best to dump all of this toxins into the gut. But if it's constipated, if you're constipated, you're just reabsorbing it all back. So it just keeps getting back to the liver. So then that can cause a sluggish liver. Liver is just not being able to work. And of course, not taking the, uh, the vitamins that you might need for the liver can make it sluggish as well. So when the liver is sluggish, hormones tend to be, uh, tend to kind of shift a lot. You can, you can get excess hormones in the body that affects a lot of these concerns that we just talked about. Next one is, the nutrient deficiency. So, you know, some what are the nutrient deficiencies that are affecting women's health, especially as we get older? Vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, selenium, B vitamins, iron, vitamin A, vitamin C tend to be a little bit reduced, partly also because, you know, we might not be eating a lot of the nutritious foods or we might not be absorbing it in the diet. And, um, and a lot of these actually gets used up by the liver to work. So uh, because the, the liver uses a magnesium, selenium, zinc, B vitamins to, to detox. So um, if we don't have enough of it for the other parts of, the, of, of what we need, if we're not taking enough, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to suffer, right? So this is another nutrient information we want to look at. So here are some uh, important key functional labs to look out to check for your inflammation. Then I run these for my patients. Um, especially if I notice that they have high um, high symptoms of inflammation. So, for example, uh, HSCRP, uh, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, LDH, and serum ferritin, 
Checking for insulin resistance would be checking for your blood glucose. Uh, we can do thyroid panels, lipid profiles, vitamin D, checking for that is very important. I recommend checking it for at, uh, twice a year. Um, plasma zinc, checking your copper zinc ratio, maybe the Dutch test to check for your hormones and GI map. These are more comprehensive tests that we can do. And this, if this is something you're interested in where you want to look at, um, a, take a deeper look, absolutely. You can, you know, we can book a meet and greet or something like that, where I can explain how these can help you. Yes. So these are some of these functional labs. So we, I believe we did a talk a while back, kind of explaining a lot of these labs and the lab results as well, what's normal, what's not normal. But when we do these analysis, it really helps to, uh, helps us figure out what's really going on. Like, why are we guessing? Let's not guess, let's test and let's address what's going on. And that way we can really target our, um, our treatment plan, you know, instead of, going to the drugstore, going to the, I don't know, Healthy Planet, for example, and buying a whole bunch of supplements. If we test it, we know exactly what we need to do to, um, to figure out our, our treatment plan. And that way you don't need to be spending a lot of money. You need to be spending a lot of doing a lot of your own research where, we, where else we can just do the testing and, and figure out what's going on. So, yes. Yeah, so with insulin resistance, another thing is that the more weight you carry, the more likely you are to be becoming at risk, right? For high blood pressure, for heart disease, for diabetes and things like that. But uh, I want to, you know, motivate you to, to, so you know that that is, that does not mean that it is forever. Like there is ways that we can lose the weight, we can become, uh, we can still like really cut down that risk of getting high, getting uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and uh, risk of your heart disease as well. And when we do that, you know, the fat cells tend to also affect your hormones because they tend to produce a, a weaker form of estrogen, but it can actually can increase certain uh, types of cancers as well and increase a lot of inflammation and can produce a lot of insulin. So the, the more we shrink the fat cells, the better, um, better of a detox process your body is going to go through as well. Vitamin D, plasma, and zinc, and copper are also very important um, minerals, and also vitamin D is a, a vitamin and also a bit of a hormone as well. And we want to really make sure that these are, uh, all of these these uh, wonderful things are up to par in your body. So doing testing for these can be really easy, actually. And um, and we want to just so we want to know these, at least I would say once a year. So that way you can compare and I have patients that I, I see where we do just blood work once a year to see how they're doing with their um, with these with these vitamin levels. That way we know, you know, we're uh, one step ahead of whatever is about to happen or whatever's going on. We're, we're being preventative. The Dutch test is a, a very comprehensive test that we can use to look at metabolized estrogen. So, you know, let's say you're really, you really know that there's something going on with your hormones and you want answers. So this is a comprehensive test that can figure out your, uh, your hormones, your um, pathway, how, how is your liver doing? How are, how is your inflammation doing? And uh, it can answer a lot of the, um, uh, and if you have some of these uh, symptoms like depression, uh, facial hair, you're, you're missing your periods or your periods are really irregular and they're really heavy or you have anxiety, um, hot flashes, weight gain, decreased libido, libido, fibroids, breast changes, really a lot of the hormonal concerns, consider doing this test. And this is something that I can order and that can show a lot of, um, a lot of answers. And this is also a very, very comprehensive stool analysis test. It's called GI map that, is, that can help figure out how, um, how bad or how many microbes are in your body, like in what, what is the, what's going on with, uh, with your gut. So this is a stool test and it can show us um, what's, your load, what's your parasites, your fungi, your viral and bacterial load. So it's another test to see where you can, you can test instead of guessing what's going on. So these are some of the 13 natural support strategies that we can do. So having an anti-inflammatory nutrition plan, practicing intermittent fasting. So this is where 
we're going to figure out how can we support ourselves so we can practice intermittent fasting ways to reduce stress and prioritize good sleep regular movement detox pathways how to reduce parasites toxins and viral load optimizing stomach acid gut microbiome vitamin d how supporting nutrients and supporting our uh how to balance our uh, hormones so let's jump into that so first and foremost is we're going to have a um very nice anti-inflammatory nutrition plan and this can be we want to in add lots of color lots of um ideally organic if not that's okay we want to add lots of fruits lots of veggies um uh, grass-fed uh, <clears throat> beef lots of healthy oils um you know wild caught salmon uh, dark chocolate and you know, lots of spices into the to the diet lots of herbs and take away as much of the inflammatory foods as possible so these are processed foods a lot of the unhealthy oils like uh, vegetable oils canola oils um processed foods um, like i said junk food and and um uh, white breads and things like that so taking away as much of that and adding as much of the fruits and veggies and good healthy oils and fats into it practicing intermittent fasting so intermittent fasting can be amazing way to reduce your inflammation can help balance um your weight and also can increase um uh, it can actually decrease signs of aging and all of those things but for women, we need to be a little bit more careful because of our hormones. So when we do fasting, too much fasting can affect some of the, some of the estrogen and progesterone hormones. Uh, so um, the, the way I recommend it is to go from how you feel, okay? So if you're noticing energy dips, brain fog, mood swings, trouble sleeping, um, irregular periods when you're fasting too much, then you might be doing it a little too much, okay? It might be too intense for you. So initially, when you're doing this, and of course, this is, um, I'm just saying this as a general recommendation. So if you want specific recommendations, you would ideally come see myself or another healthcare practitioner. But generally, you want to start slow. You want to start with the 12-hour fast, and then you can move into 14 hours, and then also 16 hours when you when you feel like, okay, my body is is handling it well and um, because you know we tend to as women we tend to be more sensitive to stress uh, compared to men we tend to produce more of the stress hormone when we're stressed so we don't want fasting to be another stress reduce stress and speaking of stress reducing stress and prioritizing good sleep so tips for a good sleep i find sleep to be a foundation of health you know if you have good sleep you have one of the biggest uh, biggest benefits of life is just having that good eight hours of sleep. So some of these are very easy tips to do, you know, like having your room room cooler, keeping your room dark as possible. So having the um, uh, blackout, blackout curtains, uh, using a sleep mask or not having coffee like six hours before you're about to sleep. Um, making sure you get enough sun exposure during the day actually can that can increase your melatonin. Exercising, exercising regularly, Avoiding bright light or using uh, blue light blocking glasses can be really good too. But let's say you have some internal inflammation that's affecting your sleep. So this is where we want to figure out the inflammation first, and then your sleep will, it, you, it will benefit from that too. Regular movement and exercise. I love this. And, and I, I, I know Dr. Justine loves this as well. It's so good. Even a quick 20 to 30 minute walk out in nature, especially like th these days, you know, it's, we're getting some amazing weather and, you know, looking at the fall colors is so, so lovely as well. Movement reduces stress, especially nature walks can improve circulation, helps with your lymphatic drainage, your mood and happiness, you feel more calmer and more happy. It balances your neurotransmitters and it reduces tension in the body and it can even help with digestion too. So amazing to go for a daily walk um, or do a quick workout, something like that to have, uh, have some of that movement in your, in your life. Improving your detox, like I said, supporting our main detoxing organ, which is the liver. Uh, we also have the lungs, the skin, and the, the intestines as kind of the primary, I mean, secondary organs, but the big, big guy, big guns is the liver. So uh, supporting the liver and, and helping it with, from, with, with diet 
and through nutrients and proper exercise, even things like intermittent fasting can benefit detoxification. So these are all things to do that can help detox, uh, detox, boost the detox process. And of course, reducing our, our infections, you know, our viral load, our parasite toxin load. And we've done multiple talks on ways to reduce this as well. But there are things you can do. And I do really, really highly recommend that you get tested before you attempt these things because there is, is a process and we want to make sure that you are supported every step. And um, sometimes, you know, when we're cleaning things out of the body, they don't want to go. So they might fight back. So you might feel worse before you feel better. So it's better to ha have someone on your team that can kind of guide you through some of these symptoms to know, okay, is this normal? Is, is what I'm going through okay? So this is why I recommend that you don't do this alone or on your own. It's best to do it with a professional. And you know, of course, you know one of the one of the ways to eliminate it is you can starve. So you can starve these uh, parasites by avoiding sugar, avoiding the um, the you know the processed foods, the the white breads, the white sugar, because they love that. So you know, when you avoid that, you're starving them. Fasting and cleansing is another one. Increasing your bowel movements, having antimicrobial herbs and supplements, detox and supporting detox. So these are all steps to take. But I highly recommend doing this with a professional. And optimizing stomach acid because, you know, the stomach acid is the gateway for uh, the rest of your digestion. You know, it really helps to digest proteins and, and fats and things like that. So when you have low stomach acid, which is like, which is a common issue in, in um, perimenopausal and menopausal women, is having a little bit of heartburn, which can actually be because of low stomach acid. Not just high, low stomach acid can cause heartburn too. So what are some things we can that we can do to optimize it? So what you can do is you can, you can have pre-made food like protein shakes that are already uh, broken down, which is easier for you to be able to absorb if you have low stomach acid. Or eating your largest meal when you're most relaxed, because when you're most relaxed, you're in that rest and digest phase. You know, that's when the, the stomach juices are at their highest. Eat slowly and chew your food really well. So you're kind of doing some of that work already before the stomach needs to break it down. So that's another great way. And uh, do not drink water uh, before or immediately after you are you have eaten because adding water is going to dilute the acid. So you want the acid to break down the food first. And then you can have water maybe an hour or 30 minutes later. And you can add fermented foods like pickled vegetables, sauerkraut, even yogurt, cheese, you can add some of that into, into the diet to help boost the stomach acid. Having a fermented drinks like apple cider vinegar, coconut kefir, kombucha can also help with um, increasing a little bit of the stomach acid and ginger is fantastic as well. And you can also add a probiotic supplement, but these steps can be more uh, simplified uh, for you to fit you. Uh, after, you know, having a consultation because, you know, some of these steps can be like too many steps, you know, for example. So these are the steps like we mentioned about what, how you can, uh, you can improve your stomach acid, improve uh, your chances of uh, getting acid reflux. And this is supporting the gut, you know, because when the gut is good, you, you feel good. You know, you feel good. When you feel good, you can do more. You can you know, uh, you feel better, you're more active, you have more energy, you know, and you have better, better health, really. So better digestion, better energy, better absorption of nutrients, better detoxification. So gut is something that I focus a lot on. I love working with, uh, with women, a lot of the female concerns actually has a, a foundation in gut too. So this is something that I help a lot with. And you want to make sure that you optimize your vitamin D3. So I always say to get test first. Uh, that way we're not, you know, we know exactly where you are. And uh, I recommend testing uh, twice a year, you know, maybe right in the winter time and also in the summertime. So that way we can see how you're doing. And optimize your zinc and magnesium and B vitamin levels. Like I mentioned, these are nutrient deficiencies that are common because you know we might not be getting it in our diet and or we might not be absorbing it so this is um these are common minerals to to add into your diet um to help with uh, with overall health 
So this is a product that Dr. Jocker is promotes. So this is something we posted here just because we want to honor his, um, because of all the work he has done in this article and this presentation uh, that this article, uh, this presentation is based on. Uh, but there is many, many different supplements. So I always recommend to do a consult first to figure out what's the right supplement for you, because we also don't want you to take in, take in something and have a side effect or an adverse reaction. And these are some female balancing hormones to consider. Um, and whenever uh, you know you try balancing anything hormonal balancing, I say to test first, uh, and then figure out from there because we don't want to uh, give you some a powerful herb that might make things worse, right? So this is something to talk to your healthcare, your naturopath, uh, your holistic professional, um, so that they you can figure out exactly how to add this to your lifestyle. And, if, and some of these herbs can be very supportive for the libido as well. And of course, you know, we can't forget the nervous system, which is which plays a huge role with a lot of the concerns we mentioned, including stress, inflammation, uh, fatigue. And um, so this is something that, you know, we obviously uh, focus a lot on our clinic and we, we just want to uh, mention that as well. That's it's one of the foundational systems that we want to fix. So that was quite a bit of information. I hope that was very informative for you. And if you have any questions, you know, I'm always available to for a meet and greet or you can message me. Uh, we have, I'm just going to talk about our upcoming webinar. So we have elimination diet. What is it? How does it work? Dr. Chi is going to talk about that. Five ways to manage your holiday stress. We can have a talk on uh, on that because you know the holidays are coming. And then we have Christmas sit and fit and also natural relief for joint pain uh, coming up as well. So feel free to join us there, tune in and connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, website. We love to hear from you. We love to hear um, ideas for talks from you because we want to give this to you as free information uh, because we want to promote uh, holistic, healthy, preventative uh, medicine and health and well-being.